When the opportunity came um, to do some work in, in schools, when I, I left teaching and then went to work for the likes of uh, Microsoft, um, at the time, I don't know if any of you can remember the school, Magic School Bus series, it was a range of um, digital uh, DVDs that were being produced for schools that teach basic sort of science ideas and literacy ideas and so on, and actually turned into a, um, a television series. Um, I was doing some research work around the design of the digital learning objects that were embedded into some of the Magic School Bus series um, DVDs. And um, it alarmed me to an extent that, th that the, um, uh, the nature of the assumptions that were made about what would happen when young children looked at these and what they would learn from them or not learn from them, as the case may be, um, that decisions were made based on um, not necessarily educational outcomes. And I think as we've moved into um, the mobile space with the uh, prolif proliferation of uh, apps and um, both on Apple App Store and in Google Play, um, we've got into a situation where there is a market, a huge market for so-called educational apps, um, m many of which have been developed and designed on a very short product life cycle where um, they are put up for a very short period of time um, at a really cheap price, um, sell huge volumes and then disappear within six months or a year with no, really assess no real assessment on the educational impact or value of any of those. It's really just um, pure volume sales for revenue generation purposes, not necessarily educational. Yet they are um, classified, if you like, as being educational apps. So when I started working on um, my research work back in New Zealand in um, 1913, uh, sorry, 1913, sorry, <laughs> the head, the head. <laughs> That's a long time. I'm, I'm very, I'm actually well preserved for my age. <coughs> Sorry, 2013, um, just after the first, well, actually started in 2012, just after the first um, iPads uh, started to come into our schools. And I was interested um, around the dynamics of how the learning environments structured and faci were facilitated around these devices and what teachers were doing with them. And I was reminded of Claiborne Maddox's hype cycle and the whole kind of pendulum syndrome of educational innovation and wanted to try to help in, in some small way to try to avoid some of those um, pitfalls around um, overstated and underperforming digital devices. Now, um, I started back in, as I say, around 2012 and I undertook a number of studies um, Around that time in New Zealand, as is happening in, in Australia at the present time, it has been for a few years, um, learning environments are changing. They're changing into large, flexible learning spaces where children, um, young children particularly, had access to bring your own, pro bring your own device programs or, um, or school facilitated access to digital devices in large numbers. And they were also able to um, work in different spaces. So there was this kind of emergence of both the mobile device and the mobile, if you like, or flexible environments. And of course that brings in major challenges for undertaking education research. Because whether we like it or not, when children work in different places and spaces on a device, teachers have very little idea what is actually going on. You know, it's physically not possible, you know, for a teacher or a teachers in a large space with 60 kids or 70 children particularly if they're five-year-olds, like I've been spending most of my time working with, we have really very little idea what they're actually doing on these devices and whether what they're doing with them is actually helping them to learn in any way. We know that they're very engaged. You know, you know it was really interesting listening to Rick's presentation this morning. I found it absolutely enlightening because a lot of findings that he was um, discussing this morning around um, what the, the lim limitations of, of animations and the, the sort of gap between the conceptual understandings that um, people bring to the, to the animated experience and what they actually get from it almost mirror completely what I've been finding with young children. And not just in the anima animation space, but also in their work with non-animated um, um, apps as well. So <coughs> a number of studies over a number of years have sort of revealed some interesting things. The first couple of investigations I did in 2013 and 14, we're really looking at the app design. So particularly, what are the features of the apps and the way that they are structured 
and I, I used um, phonics building apps for this first study. What influence did influence the students' choices and what influenced what I call their learning pathways? What were the disruptors to their pathways? What were the scaffolds or the supporters of their learning pathways? What are the particular content elements of apps that they interacted with the most? And were there of any learning value? Um, which was interesting because really rapidly, despite the number of apps we chose within the context of literacy development, we found very few that were actually of significant learning value in terms of, of the young students' use of them relatively independently, which is the typical scenario that you'll find in a classroom where students are put with an app and a device and they are given tasks to do, often with minimal scaffolding or supervision, simply because teachers can't be everywhere at one time um, providing the input necessary to perhaps scaffold or guide their learning. And the same in a home situation, if you think about it, you know, very, very uh, really, I think it would be fair to say, do parents sit with children and facilitate the learning of an app through an app with them? Often they're given a device and just told to, you know, go away and don't bother me. So what really is happening while these children are independently interacting with these devices and the apps? The second one I looked at was looking at the nature of student talk and mobile device environments. So when they're away working together, how do they collaborate or not? And what is the nature of the discourse around that? And I used Mercer's Talking Types Framework to do an analysis of disputational talk, cumulative talk and so on, just to see how they were actually collaborating as they built knowledge um, around using different apps in science, mathematics and literacy. That was followed up with a couple of other studies which particularly looked at um, learning collaboration and device features. So, you know, even though iPads in this case are particularly designed as single profile devices, you know, are there particular features that will support their use in group situations or in peer situations? And um, what is it about the physical design of the device itself? Um, what is it about the particular design of apps, uh, authoring apps, particularly content authoring apps we're focusing on then, um, that would help them collaborate or not? We also looked at um, coding and computational thinking in early years, so in this case using Scratch and Scratch Junior to help teach basic mathematics concepts around geometry. Um, and we found particular elements of the, of the software which really supported that incredibly well and others that didn't. For example, in Scratch Junior we're working with year one students. Um, the uh, lack of a visible um, drawing line or a pencil that the uh, sprite actually leaves behind as it draws shapes um, had a positive and a negative effect. It actually encouraged the students to use the grid that was available because they couldn't map necessarily conceptually in their head that they were drawing a square other than through interpreting the code. Um, so there were some really interesting things about the design of those apps which both um, supported mathematics concept learning and, and perhaps didn't. Um, not that Scratch necessarily was um, designed for teaching mathematics concepts, but it's an interesting platform where um, you can actually introduce those early years ideas around rectangles and length of sides and so on parallel. <coughs> the last one, um, which was in the senior school, looking at apps as digital scaffolds for teaching experiment procedures. So that was around declarative and procedural knowledge and whether um, apps um, it could actually help students, uh, five and, uh, year five and six, that's about nine and ten year olds, um, learn basic experimental procedures. And one of the interesting findings from that study was um, we used a series of apps called O Kiwi Book Science. Um, being from New Zealand, I thought, oh great, a homegrown product, but actually they are designed in France. <laughs> so there's nothing to do, I don't know why they flogged the Kiwi name, but that's fair enough, I don't mind at all. But one of the beautiful things about those apps was the lack of information they provided and how that, af how that affected the students' um, development of scientific thinking or thinking scientifically. Because they, they had, they had um, videos in them of uh, demonstration of procedures, but those videos weren't supported by any other scaffold at all. There was no audio, there was no instructions, there was nothing. It was just a simple video of the experimental procedure um, along with equipment needed and, uh, and so on. And um, we were working with these as the children were doing the physical experiments as well. So they were then comparing what they were, um, what the results they were getting from their physical experience with what was actually being represented on the app. And the beautiful thing about the design of those very simple apps 
was the lack of any other scaffold encouraged the speculation and, um, and, and discussion around the influence of variables and the effect of variables and differences between their experiment they were doing with their equipment and what they were seeing on the screen and why the different results may have occurred. So the, the discourse, if you like, the recordings of their discussions were really rich in scientific thinking and promoted some um, wonderful uh, analysis of, of, of variables which then could be built on by the teachers around the notion of variables and what, have aff what has affected or might have affected those outcomes. But when you're researching in mobile environments, um, there are lots of challenges. One of them is the mobility of the students. We quickly learned that um, using traditional methods when you're look at working in mobile environments, is very research methods are very challenging because you can't get a, get a, you can't track every student at the same time, especially when they might be outside, they could be hidden away, they could be in different places. So how do we collect data in those scenarios? <coughs> Excuse me. Observer effects. This was really interesting. When we first started using over-the-shoulder video in some of the early trials, we quickly learnt that the students would um, put on a show for us. Um, that little girl that is turning is actually the principal's daughter. And she was one of the worst because we've recorded her many times saying, quick, get on with it, he's coming, and things like that. And then you would also record them forgetting that they're actually being recorded through our embedded app, which I'll talk to you in a moment. And you get some really interesting feedback about what really is going on when the teacher isn't there. So the observer effects was something we needed to deal with in this scenario. <coughs> Personal learning spaces. Now, you probably can't see that very well, but these girls in the tent, and it is a tent inside the classroom, um, were quite brilliant in producing its outstanding work as long as they're in their tent. Um, they had um, relationship issues with other students in the classroom. Um, I'm sure that one of them was slightly uh, autistic. Um, yet, together they, were, they worked magic. But they worked magic because they were together <laughs> and there was nobody else bothering them. So how do you capture data from children? How do you capture data from children working in a tent, basically? And there were a number of them in this scenario, in, in this cl particular class. So the personal learning space, <coughs> capturing whole class data was another real challenge. You know, we could pick on one or two and follow them around and track them through a process, but that's one or two. And that doesn't give us a particular, and there's only me, this was unfunded research, by the way. This was, wasn't done as, as part of a big grant or anything. This was done when I had the time to do it. Um, and, you know, capturing whole class data over a period of time when you're in dispersed environments is really challenging. Capturing user device interaction. Now that's an actual picture, that's not stage, but isn't that lovely? That little girl helping the little boy by holding his hand and showing him where to actually put his finger on the device. So what was really happening collaboratively and, you know, how were the embedded design aspects of the um, apps helping or, or not helping that particular collaboration? And last of all, good old Ethel's walled garden iPads are very popular in New Zealand, a lot of schools as they are over here. While they're wonderful devices and they sort of have this quality assurance around the product of the apps supposedly that you put in front of kids, capturing data from them is incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. Um, because they're a locked ecosystem, um, up until very recently, as in the advent of OS 11, Apple hasn't allowed its um, display to be recorded. Um, and when we were doing this starting about 2011-12, we had to develop our own system that kind of bypassed Apple's walled garden. Interestingly, they've now realised the folly of their ways, or the, the, game, the game developers have got onto them and said, we need to be able to record the displays. They've actually put an embedded recorder in OS 11, but for research purposes, it's still not very good. Um, because in a typical classroom situation you have, and we've tested it out, typical classroom situation, um, the kids carry their devices around from place to place, especially when they've got those big flexible learning spaces, and they'll close the cover. Most of the time there's a protective cover of some form on an iPad. 
and of course automatically as soon as you close the cover with the if Apple's recorder, it turns the recorder off. Or if it's the device isn't used for two minutes, you know how it goes into lock mode? That turns the recorder off. So you can't capture continuous data very easily. We've tested it many times with many different covers. We've, we've tried turning off the sleep mode on the iPads, which very quickly drains their battery, believe me. Um, so really speaking, even I've even written to Apple and suggested there's a little bypass needed here, um, but of course you get no response. So even, even with the new recording system, it's actually really challenging to get good data. So we developed, um, we developed an embedded recorder that went inside the iPad, actually was hardwired into the system, if you like, um, way back in 2011, which enabled us to capture really interesting data inside the device. Now, there are very various recording systems available that mirror a single device to a, an, a, another device like, a, like a, a laptop that you can then record you know, on the laptop. But that will only record easily one device. When I mean, you've got a classroom where you've got 60 kids and you might have 20 devices going at one time, that's not going to give you, well, it's going to take a long time to get a decent body of data. So we developed an internal recording app which um, was embedded inside the machine that ran in the background of whatever the kids were doing. Now, what it does, and you'll see in a minute, it records all of the movement of what the kids are doing on the app, where they're placing their fingers, what they're saying as they're working on it, and recent versions, as you can see in the far right top corner, you can also capture the face cam. Um, there's a couple of kids you can see, you'll see them buzzing away in a moment, uh, looking at what they're doing. And the particular study that we're work going to discuss this morning used this to capture how children learnt using a series of animated simulations focused on teaching them basic circuit concepts. These children are very young, they've only been at school for about three months. Um, ethical issues around the use of the iPad were rich and varied, around the use of the recorder were rich and varied, there were plenty of them. Um, the university I worked with at the time, Waikato, was reluctant for me to use it um, simply because they saw this as being a um, almost covert form of data collection. So we compromised a lot around the assent processes and the informed consent process with parents. We demonstrated it to parents to show what kind of data we're getting and why, we, why it was important sort of data to collect. Every time I told the young children, they're going to be recorded, is that okay? And they didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And quickly, well, those who did probably forgot about it anyway. I mean, young children forget when it's lunchtime, let alone they're being recorded by an iPad. <coughs> Apart from the fact that you could see them, they could see, some of them could see themselves in the top right corner there. Um, interestingly, some of the parents did not want the um, face cam activated. Um, and some of the parents did not want any of the visual cue data available in a public display like this. There's still a lot of sensitivity in New Zealand around pub, you know, supposedly public use of, of young children's images. So we had a lot of challenges around it, but it did enable us to get some really interesting data. And I'll just play this little demo in a moment, which showed us what children really were understanding when they are using a range of apps, starting with a a sort of a, a templated simulation like this, r working right through to open designs where the children could pick up virtual wires, if you like, and connect them in breadboard situations to build their own simple circuits. So I was really interested in two things. Uh, s were simulations, um, animated simulations, useful for introducing basic circuit concepts and the function of components like switches and bulbs and um, <coughs> cells, batteries, and if so, are some of the concepts that they introduced, for example, around voltage and current flow, are they understood by students? And if so, what did they understand by them? Now, I'll just play this little sample of, the, uh, of a recorder from one of the students that I actually have got permission to. I don't know, I'll forget on this one. Well, I saw Enid. No, I saw Enid on this. No, two hours. You need two hours. That's our next. We're supposed to do next show. It's a different one. It's pretty hard. That's a variable resistor that she's got a dimmer. It's a different panel. I did it. 
the drink to her. You switched this off, baby. Oh, we're not switching this off. Wait, it's the, oh, I get it. Push it hard. Then look, the energy bars need to keep going and the line needs to turn off. And we need to not waste power, so that's why we always turn it off every time. And then when we like to turn it off, wait, wait, it's really, oh, this is going to go away. <laughs> now let's go right back. And so on. It was interesting, if you listen back carefully, they were developing early ideas about current. You know, scientifically, it wasn't quite right. You know, they, they had a, a, a consumption view or developing consumption view of, of current. You know, that an appliance uses it up, so that's why we need to turn off the power, otherwise it's used up. And what was really interesting was some of the designs of the apps that we investigated really introduced the idea of wrong science. It, which was really disturbing, particularly this one, Electronics for Kids. And I'll explain a little bit later on some of the data we captured. And this was a universal thing because there was a gap conceptually between what this app represented and what the students understood or interpreted from that animation, which was actually taking them into the area of, of wrong science, which, you know, no end of research indicates that once you start down that path road, it's very difficult to turn around. <coughs> but we had many, many examples of that. And what was really interesting about the face cam, just as an aside, um, it was a beautiful tool for understanding what was going on in the kids' minds. Quite often when we captured data, the face cam has only been available in the recorder that we developed about 2016. You know, there was an ethical issue around capturing the face cam data, which we had to deal with. But what it does, it fills in a lot of gaps. In the original recorder, we'd get a lot of pauses where we assumed that the kids were off task or nothing was happening. When we captured the face cam data, we actually saw that that wasn't necessarily the case. Quite often we get little, little nests or clusters of faces around the, around the camera, really studying hard and trying to figure out what was really happening. There was no sound, but it was thinking and learning that was happening, not off task behavior. So the face cam provided us with an extra dimension which really helped us clarify what was going on in some of those pause moments that teachers, you know, or that we were interpreting as actually not missing data, but off-task activity, which would be not, not an unreasonable interpretation. Why I was studying this, I've been really interested in animations right through because while there's been a lot done in mathematics and special education and for older students in science, there's very little being done with five-year-olds. I don't know why five-year-olds or six-year-olds seem to be kind of avoided, because they're some of the most fascinating participants to work with. But I could find no studies that actually looked at early learning science using simulations. And very little that actually used digital technologies or digital resources to teach science in any form. Yet quite a lot had been done in those other learning areas. So our research aim was really to look to see whether those simulations, the animations, could assist the students to learn the basic concepts and also looking at try, try to understand a little bit about the learning processes that they were engaged in while they were doing so. And to do that, I came up with an adaptation of David Kolb's um, experiential learning theory because it provided quite a nice analytical tool to unpack the data that we were capturing around the students' learning processes while they were engaged with those simulations. Um, the victims, <laughs> the participants, were 38 five-year-olds and they're the most delightful bunch of little kids you could ever work with. Three teachers, um, one I'd worked, that's the beauty of working in the same school for six years. Basically you can get um, a relationship with the teachers. We've had different children, same, I've worked with the same lead teacher for six years. You know, we know each other's ways of working. It's just a completely natural activity to be involved with the kids in different situations across that period of time. You could just walk in and just do it. 
small decile, a small, um, a, a, low, a middle decile, De decile was like an e SES rating, socioeconomic status rating. Five, a reasonably sized school, 520, and a large, beautiful, large, brand new, you can see the flexible learning space there. Honestly, you could hold a 10 pin bowling game down the middle of it, it was just delightful. Be brand spanking new. Um, <coughs> the learning design was really around, we paired up the students according to abilities and known levels of collaboration. We started off with um, templated uh, simulations. Um, you saw the one about the electronics for kids. We moved into more open-ended um, applications, including simple circuits and DC circuit builder. Um, the teacher role was, was I, I don't want to use the word minimal, that would be unfair, but the teacher role was really, the purpose was really to see how the children interacted with these simulations reasonably independently. So it wasn't a discovery model, it wasn't a guided discovery model, it was more than that. It was scaffolded to the extent of, of the children being introduced to the apps and about the different tasks that they'd have to do. It was problem based. They were given a series of challenges that they had to move away and then complete individually across different circuit concepts from simple control, simple uncontrolled, simple controlled circuits, uh, series circuits, parallel circuits, and um, there was a, an app that introduced the concept of resistance. We threw that in at the end to see what sense the kids made of that. So there's an example of a challenge number two. They had to produce their own simple circuit which had four wires, two, uh, what well, was a series circuit, I think, four wires, two bulbs, and one, one battery. So they're provided with the app, and they're provided with a challenge, and then they were recorded while they were doing it. The simulations, DC circuit builder, you can see that there. It's a um, dragon, it's a, um, not a drag and drop app, actually. It's a, a, a tap and place app. Um, it's an open sort of breadboard design. It has different... Um, appliances there, resistors, bulbs, uh, had a resistor in there and a um, <coughs> battery or cell. Electronics for kids, you can see that one, you saw the animation of that just before. Um, that was the one that gave, gave us the most grief actually in terms of kids building incorrect ideas about current because um, it had a, ca a tendency for the electron flow to diminish the further out it got from the cell. So now that even though if you look at that's parallel circuit, um, the, the, with the voltage being equal across all the resistors, um, as the kids put the uh, parts together, the number of electrons towards the end of the circuit diminished. You can see there, even with the second bulb, it's receiving less current than the first one, or it could be interpreted as receiving. And they, of course, the kids interpret that as less power even though the bulbs were still of the same brightness, they couldn't reconcile the difference between the brightness of the bulbs and the less or the diminished um, current. <coughs> because the electron or the energy bars, as I mean them call them, dropped or reduced in number as they went out and through the circuit, which basically encouraged them to think, well, the power's being used up. Explorament Simple Circuit was an outstanding app uh, where the children could um, respond to a number of uh, design tasks and they could also, that was set up in the app itself and they could also use it to design their own circuits. So this was great because you could actually set really open-ended challenges where the children, for example, were to design a circuit with two resistors or two appliances, we called them. Uh, you know, there were robots and bulbs and so on and so forth. And that when one switch was on, the other one was turned off, and when both were on, both were off, both switches were off, both appliances were off, and so on and so forth. The only problem is now they don't work on the new OS. So they haven't been updated to work on anything other than OS 10 or below. So we've actually got a, ser a set of iPads which have got OS 10 on them. Uh, but we're sticking with them because these apps are terrific apps which have been, unfortunately, um, taken over by Apple's um, constant upgrade process. And there was also, there was also Parallel Bulb, which, which is what is like a, almost like a three-dimensional app, um, which is what, quite complex. But one, interestingly, one group of students actually mastered the development of parallel circuits in this. And when we, we did a, a second part of the study where we gave the students real equipment, 
you know, bulbs and batteries and wires and so on, replicating what they saw in the apps, and gave them the same set of challenges and then recorded them doing the, the same task with real equipment. It was fascinating because the group that actually developed on their author own back a, um, a brilliantly extended series circuit which involved two switches, three bulbs and about two batteries, drew verbal references back to the, what they'd learned in this particular app, which I thought was really, really interesting. So there had been quite clear transfer across between the virtual and the real. This is a complicated, it was actually a really good ad, but it had, to, the, the problem was that even though it was rated for younger children up to, you know, from around seven or eight upwards, it had incredibly complex instructions. And the language was used was overly technical, which the kids just really didn't understand. The big benefit of this app was its flexibility to be able to explore and experiment by moving the wires around the breadboard in different, sh in different combinations. Now, the theoretical framework we applied to this, we started off with Kolb's basic experiential learning theory, which has four essential stages, concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract uh, abstracting, and also active experimentation. We found this really useful. Um, if, if you, if, um, sorry, in this kind of comments around the notion of what is concrete experience, and there was some debate about you know, what that actually comprises. It could be everything from actually physically engaged with an experience through to, to virtual representation of experience. So we, we, we latched on to the virtual, uh, given this was fitting the nature of our uh, activities. Um, so we basically conceptualise the simulation as, as, the, as the concrete experience. Um, the observations, the observations were collected via our recording system. We were looking for what happened, why did it happen, and what did it mean. Um, interestingly, we very quickly realised that um, the limitations of reflective observation with five-year-olds, they're not strong at that. Um, the reflective was more descriptive. So in other words, it was more describing what they saw rather than why it actually happened, or speculating on why it happened. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. So we've actually just bracketed both reflective and, and descriptive under the observation uh, element. From the observations, uh, the theory um, indicates the development of ideas or, theory or um, concepts about why things happen. So that's the abstraction stage, uh, moving through into generalisation and the testing of those theories on on, um, through experimentation before starting back again with the next concrete experience. So the whole notion of, <coughs> this has been added on to, if Kolb's original cycle was much simpler than that, but we, we basically contextualise that cycle for this particular study um, to, to, to accommodate some of the things, the early things we saw in the data. We certainly changed the, re the reflective. That's not to say some of the young children didn't seek to understand or build understanding of why things were happening because some of them actually did and they did it really well. Those ideas of why things happen weren't necessarily scientifically correct, but they were reflecting on what they had seen and interpreted and trying to make sense of it in their own way. The theories and ideas they generated from those may not be, or many times, weren't scientifically accurate, but they were sensible ideas to them, which indicated that they were reflecting on that experience and conceptualising from it. And we were really impressed with that. So these little kids were only five years old. That wasn't general, but it was certainly present. And when they moved on to test those ideas, a lot of them were very reflective on the results of why things didn't occur necessarily how they thought they might occur, or in which, in some cases, why they did occur that way. And there was a certain element of s certain elements of, of transference of that into the next simulation. So the simulations, as I said, were deliberately structured from from uh, templated through to open to see if we could look at that transfer occurring. Um, we did a tweet. We one thing you find with using screen recorders, you get a lot of data in a very short time. A lot of data. You can't code it all. It's just mind blowing. We collected 31 and a half hours, and then we across the four different simulations. We did a double-blind code. Uh, I was lucky at that stage that I could afford a research assistant who knew studio code. 
Um, we did a five hour cross check of, of sample code. We got a good, relatively good CAFA agreement on it. Um, the, the circuit concepts that were targeted, um, I actually went back to the science guy and said, look, you know, what are these apps and what are they actually showing us? And th there were five or six main concepts. The notion of circuits being closed, series circuits, parallel resistance, and controlling currents. So those are the five main um, the five main science, the uh, five main circuit concepts we were targeting. And through the learning processes, we were looking at those three. We didn't actually code up for concrete experience because that was a given, that was a, a constant. Um, the concrete experiences was their exposure to the, to the um, simulation. So we developed coding schedules that we applied to the data. <coughs> um, concrete experience, as I said, wasn't coded against us because it was you know, standard for all. Reflective observations, looking at um, circuit performance, attributes, behaviours, um, for, for example, questioning why circuits that they built were behaving or performing in particular ways. Um, we're looking at speculating from those observations. Um, we're looking for emerging ideas, science ideas or other ideas about why their circuits behaved, making sense of those observations. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And we also looked at active experimentation. To what extent were the children implementing those early theories? <coughs> excuse me. Um, we did the same for um, the, the main circuit concepts. So we built a uh, subcode descriptor for each of those, and we also um, basically interrogated the data for evidence of understanding around what, what a ser series circuit was, a parallel circuit, um, the fact that s operating circuits need to be have un uninterrupted current, they need to be closed, um, how circuits current is controlled through switches and variable resistors and so on. As you can see, it's quite an integrate. We use Studio Code to um, analyze our videos. Studio Code is excellent. It allows you to basically interrogate video data against um, frameworks. We develop the frameworks. You can see the coding template on the right-hand side. Uh, that's for concepts. Um, as you go through the video um, and you activate one of the code buttons, it enters a, a data unit on the timeline aligned to that particular code. Um, in terms of conceptual understanding, it's really useful because then you can go back and you can look at each bundle of data that you've coded under a particular concept. Um, and then you can perform your rate of agreements and so on. And then you can also more deeply interrogate and analyze the content of each of those data units. Originally it was designed and for the sporting industry for um, doing sport performance, but it's been gradually kind of uh, morphed into different purposes. And unfortunately, once again, it's now out of production. You can't get it. It's been superseded by something, um, I won't say greater, because it isn't. Uh, put it this way, it's because they want an annual, annual subscription to their uh, coding software, which is cost you more than the, the single user license for one forever. So we're, we're operating on the old version and nothing wrong with the old version. This goes back to my original problem with the hype cycle of technology. <laughs> so we're going to stick with version 10 and it's working brilliantly. Um, as long as you don't upgrade your operating system on your Mac because then it doesn't work brilliantly. But anyway, <coughs> we, did, we built the coding templates. Um, this is the one for um, concept learning. And then we coded those 30 odd hours of data and then we compared our results. Um, that you can then export into Excel and then you can do all sorts of things with this data. You can do um, total time analysis, uh, average time per unit, um, mean time, sorry, um, total time per um, code and so on and so forth. Um, one of the problems when you're using video data is distilling it into formats that are suitable for publication. And there's two issues around that. One is the video data bytes, even though we have them as live bytes, um, you know, aren't publishable in that form. Um, so what we have to do is we had to go through and transcribe all of the, um, the audio that we'd captured, and then we had to go through and match that up with the screenshots of the relevant parts where that audio was being demonstrated, and then coded against each of the main codes. And we used um, the color coding system here for 
um, understanding about the concepts. We've act actually bundled these together into single tables. We had them originally as two tables, but they actually turned into a massive document in themselves. So we've had to conflate the um, conceptual data with the, um, the um, learning process data. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So there's a couple of examples there in green where the students have um, explained their understandings of switches and um, for example, I get it, there's a switch for each circuit, so there's a switch for each one which is a concept aligned with parallel circuits where um, every appliance is on its own se separate circuit and can be controlled by separate switches. Um, we need to have them all down to make them go, so that's the whole notion of current and have continuous current across parallel and so on and so forth. So we did a a quite an intricate analysis of, of where each of the um, data units measured up against our frameworks um, and then we did the same thing for the uh, learning concepts. <coughs> Excuse me, and we colour coded them all against the, the particular frameworks. This took a long, long, long time. This took a long time, and I mean a long time. Um, and when you're doing it by yourself with only one RA that you can afford, um, this is a very, very long time. It gives you really fine grained analysis very fine grain analysis and very, very complex analysis, but it is incredibly time consuming. Um, just this is a very crude summary of outcomes, notable results. By far the most prevalent concept is around the notion of operating circuits being closed. Interestingly, the design of some of the apps helps cement that in place. Two of the apps were, had what they call snap two connectors. So when you get your wire within the proximity of one of the pegs on the breadboard, it snaps into place. Do you understand what I'm saying? Interesting, the tolerances between two of the apps that had that facility were different. For example, in the first one you saw, which was electronics for kids, the snap two connector activated at about 10 millimetres. So the kid just had to, the student just had to be in the proximity and the thing would grip on like a magnet. The other one, which was Exploraments, had SNAP2 connectors as well, but the tolerance was only around a couple of millimetres. So they had to be pretty much bang on the peg on the breadboard to actually connect for the, for the SNAP2 to, to activate. And that actually proved far more effective for un helping understand students that they need to have their circuit completed and closed than the larger tolerances, even though the initial finite time is it, even though the initial failure rate was greater, as they worked through the app more, their, their understanding of the need to be precise and connecting was much better, even though the amount of time they spent on those apps were very similar. So the design of the apps, particular designs, supported those ideas particularly. And um, operating circuit, current and switches, even though there was a lot of transfer between understanding of, of, of switches even though the represent, physical representation of the switch was different. For example, some circuit uh, apps had knife switches, you know, the knife switch goes up and down. Others had button switches that the kids actually called pumps, which was really interesting. So even though the representation of the, of the resistors, like a bulb was different in experiments compared with it, what, what it was in DC circuits, they transferred that, they understood. There was no problem, it was a seamless transition. So the conceptual transfer around the operating of, of appliances and the visual representation was seamless. Um, as we moved through, the understandings of series and parallel became less and less, yet they were still, uh, still present. But they weren't necessarily scientifically correct. But they understood that in a parallel circuit, you can have bulbs each having their own individual circuit, and they can, can be controlled by a, single, by a separate switch or a master switch. They weren't quite sure about how the current worked in those circuits, but they could understand conceptually that these were different circuits. And then in a series circuits, the more appliances or resistors you have, you know, the voltage is shared across the circuit, so therefore the performance of those resistors de decline. So the early ideas around the different circuits designs were certainly emerging. Um, the SNAP2 tolerances, the transference. <coughs> <coughs> oh, come on, move. Ugh. Um, Certainly misconceptions were emerging because of the design of the app, and this is the little excerpt from the 
Um, some, the electronics one I was talking to you before noticed, the absence, complete absence of electrons in the final circuit, which was interpreted as being consumption. And to me that was quite worrying, because if these kids are going away and using these and then developing this idea of, which is quite scientifically incorrect. Yet the simulations were actually reinforced. It's interesting, isn't it? Looks like a road of funny cars, eh? Yeah, I wonder where the energy be, uh, why the energy bars are all different. Maybe the light uses some up. Um, that's the results under learning processes. Some ed evidence of emerging ability to conceptualise reflections on observations, but most of the discussion was descriptive. What happened, not what does it mean? Um, there was a fading of the experiential theory learning loop. And I'll explain that what that is in a minute because my time is up. If you have a look at the reconceptualized Kolb cycle, this is really quite interesting. We had a lot of <coughs> excuse me, descriptive discussion around what was going on, which by and large almost exclusively led to a bypassing of the conceptualization stage. So in other words, the kids would describe and, and interpret what had happened, but wouldn't be able to theorise, if you like, about why it happened, and then generate those theories and test them. All they did effectively was bypass that whole cycle and go back to the next simulation. So they copied from one simulation to another, rather than actually theorising about the circuit designs or the operation of the circuits and so on. That wasn't exclusive. There were some that entered the cycle that, that, that talked about why things had happened in the way that they'd happened. And they brought those forward. They developed their ideas. They weren't necessarily scientifically correct, but they were ideas. And they tested those ideas. But as they went round the cycle, those ones, they, as, this is supposed to be faded. This is actually a lighter grey than this, by the way. So there was this kind of fading of the theoretical model as they went around the cycle. But we're only talking a small percentage, maybe 20% of the students who actually entered past that phase. So they started saying, you know, why did this happen? What, is the, what, what were the causes of this particular action? And what does it actually mean? So from there they started to generate their own ideas, the emerging explanations, and from there they tested those as they went to the next app. Whereas the majority just said, oh that was interesting, you know, I saw this happen, let's go on to number two. So they described without reflecting, so they bypassed that whole kind of um, abstraction stage. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and I'm, I'm just aware I'm over time, I'm sorry. In summary, we've got a very interesting, it was f it's such a fascinating study when you're working with five-year-olds, it really is. You know, that is, some of them completely amaze me what they're capable of, yet others sort of, reinforced to me how dangerous it is for teachers to make assumptions about what they are capable of and what they're actually learning using simulations, which is very similar to what um, Rick was talking about this morning, but in a very different context. So they're effective for supporting the basic conceptual knowledge of components and about the nature and the different nature of, uh, sorry, the nature of different circuit designs. Um, there were some merging ideas around voltage and current in different circuits, parallel and series circuits. Um, and there were certain elements of the apps that supported those, some that didn't. Um, there was the emergence of misconceptions that were reinforced by the design of particular apps. You know, not unexpectedly, there was limited theory generation, but there was some, which was, was some which could be built on by teachers, you know, reconstituting or reguiding those early science ideas towards scientific concepts which are accurate. Um, and I was amazed at the ideas and the rationale why the young children came up with, the explanations they came up with, what they, what they saw in those simulations. Kolb's um, theory was an interesting framework to use, yet um, there's a really interesting critique by Berg Steiner um, around the limitations, the oversimplification of the learning process, and particularly that was, it was certainly supported by the findings of this study as relates to its applicability at this age group. So what we're doing now, and what I've just finished looking at, is the data from, is the transference of those early ideas produced or reinforced by, introduced by the uh, simulations, to the same tasks using real equipment. 
And this is a lovely picture you can see of a couple of my genius scientists. It was a beautiful example of, of without any prompting whatsoever, they, they realised they'd produced a series circuit with one cell and two bulbs, and they were very unhappy with the intensity of the bulbs. Because in a series circuit, of course, it's, the voltage is steered across the appliances. And you don't get much of a performance. So they came up and said, can I have another, can I have another battery? I said, sure, what are you going to do with it? He said, we're going to put it into our circuit. And they actually ended up by putting three extra batteries in series in that circuit to make their bulbs go better without any prompting from the teacher at all. It was really interesting. These are five-year-olds, and you know, you don't do a pre-post analysis with five-year-olds. It's pretty challenging to actually get that kind of sort of experimental model going. But there was no known knowledge of circuit designs at the beginning. We had a really good discussion about what they understood about how their lights worked in their rooms, where the electricity came from. They didn't have a clue. The most common answer was it comes out of the ground through the power poles, which I thought was quite, you know, made quite sense. Well, how does it get? Well, it comes from the switch. It's produced by the switch. You know, the, the, no, one, one, pardon me, one child's father was an electrician, and he said it's carried in wires through the walls which I thought was really interesting. And that was the only knowledge of circuits that these kids possessed, which wasn't, wasn't surprising, really. So I'm just writing this next stage up using uh, metacognitive strategy analysis, uh, Giorgiardi's um, theoretical construct around how the metacognitive skills involved in learning transfer. The only study I could find that actually had tested uh, cognitive transfer with young children in science. And it was, only, it was a theoretical paper, it wasn't an empirical paper, so I'm just testing it out on the staff now. And it's proving equally challenging to write up, <laughs> equally challenging to represent in two-dimensional form. One of the frustrations using video data is that, you know, making it available, so you can, I mean, I have not complete ethics clearance to make data excerpts public, um, video data excerpts. And that's a real challenge. You know, there's a lot of sensitivity from special parents of young children for letting out this kind of information to public domain. I have got some, but not, not enough. Thank you.